When you try out strafe jumping in games like Quake for the first time, you will notice two phenomena. The first one is acceleration and the second one is the curvature of your jumping path, or more generally speaking, a change in direction. But even after several years of jumping, you are probably not able to explain why they occur. In this video, I will give a simple explanation for the physics behind the strafe acceleration in Quake 3. After you've seen this video, the reasons for acceleration, change in direction and many other phenomena will be completely obvious to you. Right now you might be thinking that you've seen a video like that before. And you are right, because you are probably referring to this video by Matt's ramblings. He seems to be a really smart guy and the level of his visualizations easily exceeds mine. However, there are three aspects that I'm unsatisfied with. The first one is the fundamental nature of Strafe Axel and I don't think that he's putting enough emphasis on it. The second one is snapping and snap zones. He is not talking about them at all. The third aspect is more general as I think that his video is too hard for the average listener to understand. For example, he is using advanced mathematical terms and even code snippets to explain the physics. This is why I will simplify the Quake 3 physics for this video. But I can guarantee that the outcome of the simplified physics and the actual physics is almost exactly the same. Let's jump right into the fundamental nature of strafe acceleration. It is a frame-wise vector addition and can be visualized with this simple graphic. Let's say that this vector is the current velocity and this vector is the added velocity, or in other words, an acceleration. Every frame, that means every 8 milliseconds, both are added together and create a new velocity vector. For now, we assume that the added velocity always has the same length. I will clarify that later. The addition of this vector obeys the following rule. An acceleration can only occur in a direction where the velocity is lower than the ground speed of 320 UPS. Let's assume that I am falling and that I have a horizontal velocity of zero. When I start pressing W, the game will notice that my current velocity in the forward direction is zero UPS. This is lower than 320, so the game allows the addition of an added velocity in the forward direction. This process will be repeated frame by frame until I reach a speed of 320 UPS. With the introduction of strafe jumping, we will now start to abuse the rules for acceleration. Let's say that I now press W and D instead of W only. The intended direction will then lie in a 45 degree angle. The speed component in this direction will be lower than the total speed of 320 units per second. Therefore, an added velocity will be applied in this direction. Geometrically, this speed component can be constructed by drawing a line from the tip of the current velocity that intersects the intended direction in a 90 degree angle. As you can see, the new current velocity vector has a higher length than the old one and a different direction. Again, this addition is repeated until the speed component in the intended direction is 320 units per second. This happens when the total speed is 392 units per second. To continue the acceleration process, one should implement mouse movements, because the intended direction stems from a combination of keyboard inputs and the view angle that is based on your mouse position. The Seagas hut can show us a mouse position that creates an angle where the speed component in the intended direction is slightly lower than 320 UPS. Let's call this angle the minimum angle. The higher the speed, the bigger the minimum angle and thus the angle at which the added velocity is applied. This can explain why the acceleration is usually lower at higher speeds, but there's another less obvious reason. Even if we assume the same added velocity, the acceleration is lower when it is applied at a higher speed, since acceleration can be expressed as the length difference between the red and the black line, and this difference is larger in the construction on the right side. I also want to cover the topic of air control in CPM physics, or A and D turning. As soon as you press A or D only in CPM, 
the game looks for speeds that are lower than 30 UPS instead of 320 UPS. Those speed components only occur at large angles, which means that the minimum angle for added velocities is large too. The length of the added velocity, however, is multiple times larger compared with a standard strafe scenario. The result is a big change in direction, but a small change in total speed. Let's move on to velocity snapping and snap zones, a topic that has been ignored for many years, but which highly impacts the gameplay in older strafe jumping games like Quake 3 or Wolfenstein Enemy Territory. Only in recent years, a thorough understanding of the consequences of the simple calculation behind velocity snapping has evolved. Until now, we have assumed that the same added velocity length can be applied in every direction. This concept can be expressed with the help of a circle. Let's assume that the length was 2 and it was applied at an angle of 50 degrees. Then the added velocity would have an x component of 1.53 and a y component of 1.28. To save resources, the Quake developers implemented a rounding of those two numbers to the next whole number. This rounding is called velocity snapping. 1.53 will be rounded to 2 and 1.28 will be rounded to 1. The result is a snapped velocity and if we draw it in the picture as a red line, it could look like this. Notice how the length and the direction of the velocity are now different compared to the original. You can probably sense that there are many velocities or a range of angles where the result of the snapping is the same. Those ranges form the so-called snap zones and this map by the defragger Tachyon shows the roundings for all possible velocities. From the perspective of a player that would be standing in the middle of the circle, the snap zones would look like this. So, how does velocity snapping influence the construction of accelerations? Let's say that this is the current velocity and this is the intended direction. We now have to move the intended direction to the snap zone map, look where it intersects the circle, trace the path to the point of the snap velocity and draw a line from the center of the circle to this point. After that, we have to transfer this line to the tip of the current velocity and draw the resulting velocity. Obviously, the scale of the circle is much smaller in the actual calculations. With this knowledge, we are properly equipped to explain even more phenomena. If you have ever wondered why you can slow down at high speeds even with the perfect strafe angle, the answer is velocity snapping. Let's say that this is the intended direction. It lies at a large angle of almost 90 degrees to the current velocity because of the high speed. It is rounded to this added velocity which is applied at an angle that is even larger than 90 degrees. Partly a backwards acceleration occurs which means that the total velocity decreases. Another phenomenon is the increase of acceleration within one snap zone when the minimum Seegers line approaches the end of the snap zone. Let's say that the black line is the current velocity and the green line the minimum Seegers line with a large distance to the end of this blue zone. No matter where you place the added velocity inside the snap zone, it would be rounded to this red line a snapped velocity that would finally be applied to the current velocity at a certain angle. If the current velocity and thus the minimum Seegers line was turned more to the right, the space between the minimum Seegers line and the end of the snap zone would be really small. The snapped velocity is still the same, but it is now added to the current velocity at a smaller angle, which leads to a higher acceleration. This concept is abused in CPM physics. You can see players pressing W only from time to time. This changes their movement direction and the position of the minimum Seegers line inside the snap zone, making the gap between the minimum Seegers line and the end of the snap zone smaller. Although the same snap velocity is applied, it leads to a larger acceleration compared to a position with a higher distance between the minimum Seegers line and the end of the snap zone. Okay guys, those are my explanations and the phenomena that I came up with. Maybe you have more phenomena in mind and already know an explanation, so feel free to post them in the comments.
At this point, I want to give a huge shout out to Jelvan because he's the guy that provided all the knowledge that I have now. He is currently working on a document that deals with the physics of Quake 3 and it's highly technical and way more advanced than this video. I will link it in the description. Have fun!